Okay. Now, I began this study of uh, Lamentations a couple of months ago, and I began it with a reminder that all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. That's 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. And I reminded you then that Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, uh, that certain events evolve, involving the Israelites in the wilderness, he says, happened to them as an example, but were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. And then Paul says in Romans chapter 15, verse 14, that whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction. And I mention that because we need to study all of Scripture, and uh, so I was grateful for honor to suggest the study of Lamentations. I have learned a lot and have enjoyed teaching it, and we need to study all of Scripture. What I want to do this morning, I want to offer some theological reflections on the book of Lamentations. In other words, I want to spell out uh, what I think are the, the major messages from the book of Lamentations for people today. Now, I've noted these as we've journeyed through. I can't help myself. I've, I've said all these things as we have gone through the book, just at different points. What I want to do today is kind of consolidate them and emphasize them, because we need to hear what God is saying to us today through what He inspired the poet to write in the aftermath of Jerusalem's fall. God inspires this poet to express these gut-wrenching emotions about the destruction and the fall just over and over again about what has happened and how just painful it is. And he inspires the poet to do that for a reason. And so we need to ferret that out and uh, hear what God is saying to us today through that. Now after that, I plan to say a bit about the history of the region following the exile. And I think that not only, I hope it'll be interesting to you, you I, presumably you know it, but at least I can remind you of it, but it's good in studying to kind of have a grip on, on history and what has happened. So I want to go from the exile, the history of that region, up until the coming of Christ, the birth of Christ. So you'll have an idea and an understanding of that, and that may help us if I do in fact do what I'm going to, what I'm thinking about doing in the, the next quarter which I think starts in December. I hope that's right. Uh, I'm thinking about teaching Daniel. Now, I usually go from Old Testament back to New Testament, that kind of thing, but Daniel seems to flow so naturally out of this lamentations and this exile. Uh, that's what I'm planning to do. I'm not committed to doing it yet, but I'm, going to, I'm thinking about doing it. Now, before we get started, I realized uh, after the class last week that I mistakenly referred to the Old Testament scholar Paul House who, uh, he, he's the author of the Word Biblical Commentary on Lamentations. I refer to him as Wayne House. Wayne House is a different biblical scholar. So I confused those two uh, when I was talking about relying on a, on a translation by somebody, so I wanted to correct that. If we finish early, uh, I don't know that we will, I'll just uh, see if you guys have some ideas on things that struck you uh, during our study, but uh, we'll just see how that goes, because as I say, I never know... Uh, you know, how long something's going to take me just depends on how much I detour and start ranting, you know. <laughs> All right. First thing I want to, theological reflections. First thing I want to emphasize that I gather from the book of Lamentations is that God is faithful to his word, including his word of judgment. You see, this is something that comes out loud and clear. God told the people of Israel during the ex exodus, and during the time of the wandering in the wilderness, that there would be horrible consequences if they were unfaithful to him. That there would be dreadful, terrible consequences. There would be curses if they were unfaithful to him. He told them that over and over. And he emphasized it to them. And he recorded those warnings in Scripture for all subsequent generations to learn. And he said, not only that, he said, listen... It is your duty and your responsibility because this is so important. You must transmit this to your children. You must hold these things in your mind because God knows the tendency people have to forget something. If it's not happening now, it's ancient history and I don't care about it. So he said, here's what you have to do. You must make yourself keep this alive. 
And you must transmit it to your children because it's life and death. It's blessings and curse. It's that important. You must transmit to them the truth that unfaithfulness to me will bring devastation and horror. So God told them that. He emphasized that to them. But after rebelling for centuries and still remaining in the promised land, the people of Judah, they deceived themselves into thinking that God wouldn't make good on that promise. They got it. No, no, that's not going to happen. Yeah, I, yeah, 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 okay, yeah, all that stuff, you know, you know all that old fire and brimstone stuff, I, you know, all that I hear, but, you know, that, that's, you know, God's grown. He's really matured out of that. And so they deceive themselves into thinking, no, God's not going to keep that promise. They mistook his forbearance, they mistook his patience as an indication that he wasn't going to keep his word of judgment. That's not going to happen. Now, they had different theological rationales for it. They said, look, no, God's going to preserve Jerusalem because that's where he hangs out. You see, that's his special place. He's going to preserve Jerusalem. He'll never let anything happen. So the word of judgment that he told us, and he said, no, I'm going to, I'm going to you know, tear the place down. That's not going to happen. So they deceived themselves into doing that. So God is faithful to his, word of, to his Word, including His Word of judgment. Now, God has promised in His Holy Word that Jesus Christ is going to return. And at that time, the entire world is going to be judged through Him. He has said that. He has made that perfectly clear. The faithful, those who in penitence have trusted in Christ, will be eternally blessed. He's made that clear. Whereas all those who have not embraced Christ and thus at the judgment who will stand in their sin, they will endure eternal punishment. He has said that. He has announced that. Proclaimed it. He's made it clear to people. Jesus declared in the parable of the net in Matthew chapter 13 verses 49 and 50, so it so will it be at the close of the age the angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth and you say well, what, you, what is this idea here's what you need to know about that weeping and grinding of teeth is the sign of a bummer okay however you want to take the judgment you have to see that when you're picturing somebody as weeping and grinding their teeth in misery, uh, uh, God is saying to you, this is a nightmare. You see, this is an absolutely horrible condition to be in. And this truth of judgment is repeated in the parable of the wheat and the weeds. Matthew chapter 13, 24 to 30, 36 to 43. The parable of the workers in the vineyard. Matthew chapter 20, the parable of the faithful or unfaithful servant in Matthew 24, Luke 12. Parable of the ten virgins, Matthew chapter 25. The parable of the talents and the minas in Matthew 25 and Luke 19. And the parable of the sheep and goats in Matthew 25. It's not like it's isolated. It's repeated. It's made clear. The Word of God says, blessing and joy and wonderful things. For those who are mine, for those who embrace Christ, for those who are Christians. Horrible situation. Horrible punishment for those who reject me. Now recall Jerusalem's lament. You know, the city is speaking in Lamentations chapter 1 verse 15. The Lord rejected all my mighty men in my midst. He summoned an assembly against me to crush my young men. The Lord has trodden as in a wine press the virgin daughter of Judah. So here is the description of this horrible suffering that they have endured in the judgment of Jerusalem. And it is said to be, he says, the Lord has trodden in a wine, as in a wine press, the virgin daughter of Judah. This is the idea of destruction. You can see this person walking with the grape juice splattered on him like blood. And so this is the image of crushing, of destruction, of slaughter. And so it's very fitting when, it, when the city says the Lord has trodden as in a winepress the virgin daughter of Judah. Well, Revelation 14 
speaks of the harvest of the earth that will occur at the end of the age. And in verse 19, the condemned are thrown into what? Into the great winepress of the wrath of God. Verse 20, in verse 20 states, And the winepress was trodden outside the city, and blood flowed from the winepress as high as a horse's bridle for 1,600 stadia, about 184 miles. The blood flowed from the wine press of this judgment. And so what is the picture? Well, what, what is it being said in Lamentations? It is a horrible judgment. And here we have it being described in Revelation. Revelation 19.15 identifies the Lord as the one who will tread the wine press. Do we see the Lord Jesus that way? The one who will tread the winepress, it says that the Lord on his return will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. Jesus the warrior, you see, coming in judgment. And it's there. It's there perfectly plain. Jesus says in Matthew 25 verse 41 that the final judgment, the condemned will be sent to the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. The eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And we see in Revelation 20.10 that, that in that fire, the devil will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And then in Revelation chapter 20, verse 15, it says, if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Why do we have such an aversion to saying that? We do. We say, people don't want to hear that. Well, the people in Jerusalem didn't want to hear what the prophets had to say, so what did they do? They didn't say it. They just won't, they don't want to hear that. I know they don't want to hear it. Nobody wants to hear it. The question is, is it true? And if it's true, they need to hear it. Right? They need to hear it. If it's true, and of course it is, because this is what God is saying. God will be faithful to his word of judgment. We have to see that. He will judge mankind in his time regardless of who says or thinks otherwise. Just as you had people there thinking they had deceived themselves with their rationale saying no, despite the fact God had said, this is going to happen, I'm, this is going to happen, if you're unfaithful I'm going to do this, 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 spelled it out in detail. You're going to have somebody from a nation, you don't know their language, they're going to come. They're going to slaughter, you're going to be eating your children, it's going to be an absolute nightmare, you're going to hate it, you're going to hate it. He spelled it out in detail, yet they were able to say, that's not going to happen. Well, see, that's part of the thing. You see, our, our world wants to distance itself and say, that's not going to happen. And we can't be complicit in that. We have to be the voice that says, it is going to happen. It is going to happen. As, as the world's trying to push and push and silence and silence, the Word of God says, it will happen. And we have to say it. We have to say it and we have to be a voice that lets that truth, that lets that truth be known. Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, But do not let this one thing be concealed from you, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like one day. The Lord is not slow concerning the promise, as some regard slowness, but is patient towards you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. Well, see, just as they had taken his forbearance, his patience through the centuries... Right, he had told them this in the Exodus in the wilderness wandering. This doesn't happen until 587, 586. Centuries. Well, he, he, well no, no. He, look, look, no. We've been living now, though. That, that's old, old news. He's not going to do it. Well, God is going to do it. You see, he's not slow. He's patient. And we have to tell people the truth. And secondly, so the first thing is, is that God is faithful to His Word, including His Word of judgment. We can't deny that, hide from it. In fact, as I'll say in a minute, we have a duty to proclaim it. But God is faithful to His Word, including His Word of judgment. And secondly, as declared in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 31, and this is clear from what I just said, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You see, the judgment of God is no small, trivial, no big deal, I'm tough, I can handle it, bring it on. It's none of that. 
None of that. It is an absolutely dreadful thing. That's what, when you read Lamentations, do you get any of that? Do you get any of that of somebody on this side of the judgment going, hey, I know, go ahead, hit me with your best shot. You don't get any of that. What you get is somebody who's completely just broken and just down and saying, have mercy. Have mercy. Look, look how we're suffering. Lord, look. Look how terrible it is. That's what you get. You get that. You don't get attitude because it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. See, the agony of God's judgment, it is portrayed powerfully in the poetry of lamentations. That's what I said. See, that's why it's done that way. Instead of a clinical statement, here's what's coming. You have this poetry of just getting at the emotional side of what is involved in this judgment. And why does God want to do that? Because He wants you to feel how horrible it is. You see, so you will actually uh, you know, relate to it from that side as well as just from the clinical, informational side. See, when God pours out His wrath, it will be utter misery for those who receive it. Absolute, utter misery. And those who ignore that fact or deceive themselves about God, God's judgment... They will forever exist in the sorrow of lamentations. How would you like that? If you've pictured, if, if you have absorbed what is being said in lamentations, how would you like to spend forever in the sorrow of that book? I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to. And this is why, this is why God is saying, listen, look, hear. This is horrible. The third point I want to make is that people must repent while there's time. People must repent while there is time. Once the judgment of God comes, it's too late. When God pulls the trigger, when the fire burns, when He brings the army, when He destroys the city, He has pulled the trigger and judgment is done. It's too late then. Well, what was he doing all of these centuries before? Urging, pleading, while there was time. Repent, repent, come back, come back. Be faithful, be faithful, be mine, be mine. All the time. And what are people doing? No, 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 no. Forget it, drop dead, drop dead, drop dead, drop dead. Judgment comes. Too late. It's too late. And given that there's no changing one's fate between the time of death and the final judgment at Christ's return, as the parable of the rich man and Lazarus makes clear in Luke chapter 16, repentance is always a matter of utmost urgency. It is a matter of utmost urgency if you are living in rebellion to God. If you are, you know, one of these double life people. You come to church, you smile, but you're living in sin. You see, and by what do you mean by that? I don't mean stumbling in sin. All people sin. And I've said many times, you know the difference, right, between the kid who's trying to do something and fails and does this and gets up and says, I'm sorry, and, I, and the kid who says to his parents, <laughs> there's a difference, right? There's an attitudinal difference where somebody says, listen, I don't care what you want. I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to be God. And a person who seeks and in weakness stumbles and says, I'm sorry, that's all of us. But there's a different attitude there. So I'm talking about somebody who says, listen, I think I can fool these people. I can go live in sin. I can live in an immoral sexual relationship. I can live uh, doing drugs and intoxication or drunkenness or whatever it is. And I don't care what God wants. Well, you need to repent. That's not a mean thing to say. That's not somebody saying, who do you think you are? I think I'm somebody who can read and understand what God is saying, and I'm trying to help you. I don't get any charge out of it. To sit and say, hey, you know, you need to repent. It's a duty. <laughs> you see, I'm trying to help. And anybody who says that to you is trying to help. And so this is an important thing. No one is guaranteed tomorrow. You just look around, you have to see that. That's not just words. Nobody's guaranteed tomorrow. 
And repentance is a matter of utmost urgency. Why delay? Why put it off? Why stay in the hog pen longer? Don't. And as I've said many times, I don't care what you have done. I don't care how many times you have done it. The door to God is always open for the penitent. Always open for the penitent. So just whatever it is. You see, you need to decide I'm through with it. I'm coming back to faithfulness to God. And that's a message that I see. Now finally, the last uh, theological reflection I want to get is that those of us who know the truth of God's judgment, we have a duty to sound the alarm. Listen to Ezekiel chapter 33, verses 17, or chapter 33, verses 2 through 6. He says, Son of man, speak to your people and say to them, if I bring the sword, of, the sword upon a land and the people of the land take a man from among them and make him their watchman, and if he sees the sword coming upon the land and blows the trumpet and warns the people, then if anyone who hears the sound of the trumpet does not take warning and the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and did not take warning. His blood shall be upon himself. But if he had taken warning, he would have saved his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet, so that the people are not warned, and the sword comes and takes away one of them, that person is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at the watchman's hand. You see this idea that those who understand the truth, who remain silent about it, are culpable. You see, they are culpable because they did not sound the warning. You sound the warning, okay? People don't heed it, they don't heed it. But if you shut up and say, no, I'm not going to sound the warning, they'll think I'm odd. They'll think I'm funny. They'll think I'm this. They'll think I'm that. Okay? Well, he says that's culpable because you did not sound the warning that would have been life to those who would have heeded it. So I think that's important. All right, let me say a little bit about... Uh, Israel's history from the exile to Christ. The poems of, of Lamentations, as you know, they mourn the devastation of Jerusalem that took place at the fall of Jerusalem in 587, 586, and the associated exile of all but the poorest of the city's inhabitants. So you have this devastating, you had an exile in 605, some of the people were taken off, that's when Daniel went. 598, 597, you had people carted off, that's when Ezekiel went. 586, 587, you have the city being destroyed and, and further exile of, of inhabitants, leaving just the poorest there uh, of the city's inhabitants. Then in 539, in keeping with a prophecy that was given well over a century earlier, that's recorded in Isaiah chapter 44 and 45, in those chapters, in keeping with that prophecy, in 539 B.C., the Persian Cyrus entered Babylon, and he established himself as the king of a new world empire. So we have this great kingdom, uh, Babylonia, ruling at the time, yet there's a prophecy in Isaiah 44 and 45 that God's going to raise up this man named Cyrus. And Cyrus is going to be the downfall of this great kingdom of Babylonia. Well, that's what happened in 539. And then in the first year of Cyrus's reign, which is reckoned from 538, 537, he authorized the Jews to return to Palestine and to rebuild their temple. Now, for a long time, people said, well, that, that wouldn't happen. That doesn't sound like a king from that time. And then we found the Cyrus Cylinder, where you see that's exactly kind of his political proclivities. He thought that was advantageous to let people go. They'd be friendly and that kind of thing. So we have, we have that, uh, but skeptics, there's no end to them. Uh, so here we, we have, the, we have the, uh, the Jews are authorized to... He authorizes the Jews to return and build, and he even returned the sacred vessels that had been seized from the temple by Nebuchadnezzar, and he agreed to partially finance the reconstruction of the temple from the treasury. Now, this is, this is huge, right? But God had said, you know, he had promised, there's going to be this exile, there's going to be this destruction, that's the ray of hope that had been sounded from way back in the Old Testament all the way down through Lamentations where God is going to bring them back. Well, the first, the first group of Jewish exiles returned to Jerusalem under the leadership of Shesh Bazar, Zerubbabel, and Jeshua, which is an alternate form of Joshua, not the Joshua from the book of Joshua. 
So you have there the first exiles, they come back and they return. Now it's often assumed that they arrived back in 537, but it could have been a year after that when they actually got there, or a year or more. That's not pinned down that exact, that precisely. So we have, we know that when, when uh, Cyrus comes in, the Persian uh, ruler, Babylon falls, he issues a decree in his first year, 538, 537, in that first regnal year, he issues a decree that they can return. Now, how long did they plan to return? You know, I've read somebody who said it was as long as five years that they were planning to return. These are things just speculation. A lot of people assume 537. It could have been a little bit later than that when they actually arrived back. But uh, they promptly, they get back and they promptly set up the altar in its former place and they resumed offering sacrifices amid the temple ruins. You know this from the uh, book of Ezra. You see that, so you have, you have they come back, they, they rebuild the temple, or the altar, not the temple, they rebuild the altar and they're, they're here uh, engaging in sacrifices amid the temple ruins. And then in the second year after their arrival in Jerusalem, they laid the foundation for a new temple. So they started to build, first year they have the altar and they're offering sacrifice, then they want to rebuild the temple they start in their second year back, and then opposition from the local residents and the neighboring communities, especially the Samaritans, they cause that work to what? It just ground to a halt. You see, they were here, they're back, we're going to build this temple, but you had all these people. You know, just after them, after them. You know, trying to rat them out to authorities, trying to do this, always trying to discourage them and create obstacles to the rebuilding. So what happens? They start to lay this, the foundation for this temple, but then the work grinds to a halt and the temple was still in ruins in 520 B.C. More than a decade later, that's when the prophets Haggai and Zechariah motivated the people to resume the work. So you had this period of time, maybe 15 years, uh, 16, 14, long time, when the, they had laid the foundation, the work grinds to a halt, they're doing nothing. That's when you have the prophets come in and say, hey, your places are getting built. If you lived here, you'd have rebuilt it. And so that stirs the people up and they wind up resuming the, the reconstruction project and they complete that, that new temple in 516 or 515 B.C. Then very little is known of the history of the Jews in Palestine from that point until Ezra comes back. So that's the first wave that you get coming back under you have Shesh, Bazar, Zerubbabel, and Jeshua. And then there's this period where, you know, not that much we know about until Ezra comes back. And he comes back in 458 B.C., some 58 years after the temple was built. So he comes back 458 B.C., and then 445, which is 13 years later, Nehemiah came to Jerusalem from Babylonia to help restore it. And you know the whole story about the walls. And I actually think the walls had been... Uh, almost completed under Ezra, then destroyed again, and then that's the news that reached Nehemiah. I don't think they had been that way from the destruction in, the, you know, in 587, 586, because it seems Nehemiah would have known about that. And here, when he gets the news, it sounds like it's news. So I think they had, they had almost gotten that complete or had completed despite these uh, attempts, and then somebody had taken it down when they got the word from, uh, I think, Artaxerxes, that, no, go ahead, they should stop that, and then they took that as, okay, you shouldn't have been doing this, and they tore it down. Now, all of that's not written. I'm just saying that makes more sense to me. But anyway, you have, you have Nehemiah comes back, 445. Nehemiah comes to Jerusalem, and after he serves as governor for 12 years, he returns to Persia in 433 B.C., and a short time later, he comes back to Jerusalem for a governorship of unknown length. So here is kind of the play out. Now, that ends Old Testament-inspired history. You might want to take one of the minor prophets, maybe Malachi, and say he shed some light somewhere later. But you wind up having here, that's the end of Old Testament history. Okay, well, that's a long time. Whether you want to take it down to 400, 432, something like that. We have a long time. There's a long gap. This is, of course, called the intertestamental period. It's because it, it's between the period of history, the Old Testament, and the New Testament. So it is that time of history between those two periods. Well, what was shaken there? What happened there? Uh, from the period, of, the period from 433 or 432 down to 333 is a time of almost total obscurity. Okay, very little that we know about what's going on there. During that time, the Jews continued to live under the Persian Empire. The Persian Empire is now, they're the dukes. They have replaced the Babylonians. 
And so this period of time, the Jews are living back in Palestine under the Persian Empire. But in 333, now we have something that happens that comes on the scene as Alexander the Great. In 333, Alexander the Great, he comes up and he begins to engage the Persian military. So here, he's a Greek or from Macedonia, he comes out, and Alexander the Great, he starts engaging him in 333, and by 331, he had gained control of the Persian Empire. That was a short period of time. And you'll see one of the things in Daniel where it says that this guy comes out and he charges a cross, you see? And that's referring, of course, to Alexander. And so he comes out, he takes the Persian Empire, and here's Alexander's empire, that he just came out from Macedonia and just... And just charged out. Now this is a young guy. But he was obviously a military genius. And he went out and he took over. Took control of, of the Persian Empire. And this ultimately led to the widespread adoption of Greek culture throughout the empire. Why is the New Testament written in Greek? That's why. <laughs> because Alexander came and conquered all the territory. And what happens? Well when you conquer somebody. Eventually see your culture and language and everything. Becomes the norm, and so that's how you had Greek influence so wide around the time of the New Testament. So when they're, that's why they write in Greek. And so here you have Ale Alexander comes out and, and does this. Now, following his death in 323, so he's only 333 to 323 when he's really on the stage. That's a short time, but he did a great deal. Now, in 323, he dies, and his kingdom is divided between four of his generals. And you see here the two, who you have Cassander, Lysimachus, Seleucus and Ptolemy are the two that are really of interest. You have Ptolemy I and Seleucus I. When Alexander dies, his kingdom's divided up, up, up between these four, and you have Ptolemy I is down, he's controlling Egypt, you see. Right? You, am I in the way? You can see Ptolemy down there, he's controlling Egypt. And Seleucus here, his empire, he's controlling Syria, and he goes out and extends into some parts there of Persia. So he has, he has gained Syria and Mesopotamia. But for some years, see, there was a battle between the Seleucids and the Ptolemies for control of Palestine. You see Palestine. Does this thing have a little pointer on it? It does. Palestine, right in here. You have the Ptolemies down in Egypt. You have the Seleucids over here. But for a time, there was this, they were vying for who's going to control Palestine. And, and the Ptolemies succeeded in controlling Palestine until 198. Okay, 323, Alexander dies. We have the, his empire divided up among his four generals. We have the Ptolemies in Egypt, Seleucids in Syria, and they're kind of vying for control. But the Ptolemies controlled Palestine until 198, at which time it falls into the hands of the Seleucids. They then gain control of that. And then from, from 198 to 165, Palestine is under Seleucid control. Some would say 164. I mean, you always have like a you know, little wiggle room on these dates. But from 198 to 165, Palestine's under Seleucid control. And in one, 175, this character, one of the Seleucids, a guy named Antiochus IV, who's known as Epiphanes, appearance, as in manifestation of God. But this guy, he's a Seleucid ruler, Antiochus IV, and he's there from 175, he comes, he comes on the scene, he began to rule. Now what he does is he seeks to force the Jews to adopt Greek ways which were contrary to their religion. So he was, this guy's a nightmare. He comes in and he wants these Jews to adopt Greek culture and to forget their religion, their heritage. And he wants, to, he wants to force them to be non-Jews is what he's trying to do. And you can imagine how that went over. Okay, so he's, trying, he's doing this. And his efforts to do that, it sparked a successful Jewish revolt. Which began in 166 B.C. And this is called the Maccabean Revolt. Aha, Bell won. This is the Maccabean Revolt. So there will be no uh, comments after because I'm not through. But he starts in 166, this is the Maccabean Revolt. Okay, so the, the, he sparks this. It's named for one of its prime figures, Judas Maccabeus. So these Jews rose up because this guy Antiochus IV Epiphanes was doing this. They went crazy and they started this revolt known as the Maccabean Revolt. 
And so then beginning in 142, okay, so that starts in 166. 142, Simon completes the work of his brothers, Judas, Maccabeus, and Jonathan, in securing for Israel a good degree of autonomy and freedom from paying tribute, if not complete independence from Syria's influence anyway. But have relative autonomy that he winds up, they wind up achieving, and this autonomy endured until Roman intervention. And this period, from 142 down to Roman intervention with the commander Pompey in, in 63, this is called the period of Hasmonean rule or Hasmonean kingdom. So that's what we have uh, from, from 142 down to 63. And when they, when they uh, by the way, when they came back here and I said here that the temple is, is desecrated, this guy, Antiochus IV, he desecrates the temple. In fact, he sacrifices a pig on the altar. And you know, the holiday Hanukkah. Okay, well, what that is, is that's when the Maccabeans in this revolt, they regained uh, control of, of the Temple Mount in 164, 5164, and then they rededicated or consecrated the temple that this guy had desecrated. And that's what's celebrated in the holiday Hanukkah, okay, or Feast of Dedication. So th that's, all, that's all going on here as part of the history. Now in 63, the Roman commander, he took control of, of Palestine. So now who's, who's coming on the horizon now as the, as the kingdom? Rome. Okay, so we had, we had the Babylonians. Then we have the Medes and the Persians under Cyrus. Then we have Alexander. And now we're having Rome will become the next great power in the region. But they take control in 63. And then you have Julius Caesar. He defeats the commander who took control of Palestine. He defeats him in 48. He's murdered in 44. Julius Caesar is in 42. Uh, during another political... Well, he, he, Antony defeats Cassius, appoints Herod at this time as Tetrarch of Judea. Okay, Herod is an Idumean, and he's appointed by these Romans as Tetrarch of Judea. And then around 40, there's a political uprising in Israel, and Herod goes to Rome in 40, and what do they do there? They designate him then king of Judea in 40. And then in 37, he finally really firmly establishes his rule in 37 B.C., and he continues to reign down until 4 B.C. He dies shortly after the death of Christ. Now, this always puzzles people. You say, how in the world is Jesus, which B.C. means before Christ, how is he born 5 B.C.? You know, how is that? And some people would move it around. Some people would say 6. And, you know, it's pretty, most everybody dates Herod's death from 4 B.C. So maybe you could nudge Jesus' arrival into 4 B.C. But it was just an error. The monk that uh, in, the, in the 500s, the monk who decided to start dating events from Christ's birth, he just made an error because he's judging. He thought Jesus had been born, I think, 753 years after the founding of Rome. Well, it turned out that wasn't right. Uh, he was born actually 749 years, but that was already institutionalized, so you just keep it there. And so that's how. So he comes, and so he comes to Herod, and then interestingly, uh, just because of my recent studying of Daniel, you know, Jesus comes and he's saying, what, what is his message? The kingdom of God is at hand. So he comes proclaiming this kingdom of God that uh, in these certain visions in Daniel you see, you know, seems pretty clear to me that he's saying, listen, there's going to become this empire and here comes this rock and this, this kingdom will, will be established. And then he says it will grow and be, you know, this great thing. But uh, Jesus comes saying that in the, uh, in the you know, that's his, that's his message. And I've talked about that an awful lot. Now, uh, I'm through. We have probably 10 seconds. Uh, but I hope, the, uh, I hope the study was of some benefit to you. And like I said, next week, uh, okay, thanks.